Good morning. I think we're at nine o'clock, so we're ready to start. Uh, welcome. My name is Gene Sykes. I am the chair of the board of the Alliance for Southern California Innovation, and I'm pleased to wel welcome you this morning to the second day of our first look event that we host together with LAVA. Uh, I'd like to talk just a bit about the Alliance for Southern California Innovation, which is a small organization with a very big mission. And we've been around for about three years, and it was started with the idea that Southern California has a remarkable trove of talent in our research institutions uh, between all the universities of California, Caltech, USC, the Claremont Colleges, the Sanford Institute, the Scripps Institute in San Diego, et cetera. And we have tremendous talent and capability in our region. Uh, we also have great innovators in our region, uh, but we're not uh, as uh, significantly represented by venture capital investments and startup entrepreneurs as we should be. In fact, Silicon Valley is much bigger than Southern California in spite of the fact that Southern California has a bigger population, graduates more engineers, and actually has more research institutions doing the work of innovation and science that leads to new company formation. So as we recognized this issue, we said, we need to bring more attention to what Southern California has to draw more entrepreneurial talent and to draw more funding, more early stage and middle stage venture capital uh, to provide the capital that the, uh, the scientists, the innovators, the, uh, uh, the founders, the entrepreneurs need to build their small businesses. So that's the mission. And we've been working in many ways to try to simulate that. The first look event, uh, which LAVA has run for many years and we've helped over the past several years is a way of doing that to bring attention to innovation that starts in research institutions around the region and then develops into businesses. Businesses that we can see uh, venture capital investors um, attach themselves to and help to build into significant uh, enterprises. So we appreciate your interest in this mission and we hope that today is, uh, is part of that. Uh, I see we've got a screen from uh, Biozen Batteries, which may be our first, uh, our first presenter. But let me uh, uh, introduce the keynote speaker who will actually precede any of the companies this morning. Uh, and before I do that, I'd like to thank both Alexandria Real Estate Equities and Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati for their sponsorship and very significant support and involvement in both the Alliance and in this event. Uh, they've been tremendous partners and we wouldn't be here this morning were it not for their uh, support and uh, interest and involvement. So I'd like to introduce Alan Jacobson. Alan is the Chief Data and Analytics Officer, the CDAO of Alteryx, driving key data initiatives and accelerating digital business transformation for the Alteryx global customer base. As CDAO, Alan leads the company's data science practice as a best in class example of how a company can get maximum leverage out of its data and the insight it contains. He is responsible for data management and governance, product and internal data, and the use of the Alteryx platform to drive continued growth for the company. Prior to Alteryx, Allen held a variety of leadership roles at Ford Motor Company across engineering, marketing, sales, and new business development most recently leading a team of data scientists to drive digital transformation across the enterprise. Alan was an Alteryx evangelist at Ford. He spent many years leveraging the Alteryx platform across the company, and he witnessed firsthand the impact of a, of a culture of analytics uh, and how that can change the bottom line and what it takes to succeed as a data-driven enterprise. Alan will extend his role as an evangelist to customers helping data workers and business leaders alike foster a culture of analytics and deepen their investments in digital transformation strategies. And with that, I'd like to welcome Alan as the uh, keynote speaker this morning. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, so again, my role as the Chief Data and Analytics Officer is a fewfold, but uh, related to, to this audience, you know, Alteryx is a platform that, that helps enable people to, to build analytics. Uh, into software, into solutions. And we've, we've had many companies have success doing that. So I, I'm, I'm gonna talk today from, from really the perspective of, you know, what does it mean to be a, 
a modern day company today? Uh, what types of analytics are, are getting deployed? How have things changed over time? How might your customers be looking at some of this as, as you go to market with potentially products that, that you're trying to put out into the world? And so with that, you know, the use of analytics we see happening everywhere. There's really not an in industry or a domain. Um, I'm assuming for most entrepreneurs today building solutions, it's hard to imagine anyone building a solution that doesn't use some form of data analytics in the solutions uh, that they're building, whether they're doing sports analytic or marketing, shipping, logistics, manufacturing, um, analytics are really being used pretty much everywhere. And so when we look at what, what brings success as you, as you leverage digital transformation technology and analytics into businesses and into solutions, there are really three things that are the recipe to success. You, you, you clearly need some technology to enable this all to happen. You need an ability to compute and schedule and, and wrangle around data. Um, you need algorithms. Uh, the, the open source is, is full of wonderful, wonderful solutions. There are also you know, commercial uh, algorithms, but at the end of the day, uh, most of the world is using algorithms from the open source. And then there's domain intelligence. You have to know something about something. So if you're building a, a solution in the security space, you, know, you have to have domain knowledge, obviously, of that space. And when you combine these three things, uh, the right technology, the right algorithms, the right domain knowledge, uh, this is where we really see the transformative uh, stuff happening out, out in the world. And as people go to apply this, you know, one of the things you know, we, we bring to the table is this platform of building blocks so that uh, you don't have to basically build the complete tech stack. Well, what we see a lot of startups, quite honestly, do is they burn a lot of their time and a lot of their capital early on building a tech stack versus simply uh, leveraging a tech stack uh, with building blocks that will enable them to build the solution they need. So I, I put one slide in here that's kind of very specific to Alteryx. Most of the rest of the, the talk this morning will be uh, more on kind of the industry and the trends. But uh, the perspective we have is we, we go to market with a set of building blocks, automation building blocks that you can combine in any way you want uh, to be able to prep and profile data, blend, do predictive analytics, uh, explainable AI, code free or code friendly, connecting really any data to any output. And so as you, as you build a, a new company, a startup, uh, you know, one of the things that and we hope that you don't do is build an all new analytics stack that you can leverage something that's already out there. And so I wanna rewind in time and kind of give you perspective of kind of some of the trends that, that we see. And these trends started a long time ago, just to get people warmed up to the chat window. Uh, I'll, I'll give a test. We'll see if anybody can answer it. Anybody know who this is? Uh, who, whose picture is on the screen? Um, we're reading, rewinding in time. The date is 1854, if that helps place the picture. It's not, it's not a self-portrait. Um, good guesses, Babbage, Tesla. Um, these are great guesses. I picked somebody who it might resonate more being that we're in a global pandemic. And, and Andy actually gets the only right answer. He said some old dude. I guess he's really old if he was around in, in 1854. Uh, this is John Snow, and, and maybe the hint is faintly in the backdrop. What you're seeing is a street map of London. And John Snow set out to, to solve uh, an epidemic, a, a pandemic that was happening in London. It was the cholera outbreak. And he wanted to try to figure out how to stop the pandemic from, from spreading. And the graphic in the background is actually not only the street map of London, but it has little bar charts basically at different addresses uh, around London, where he's basically counting the number of people that had been hit by the cholera epidemic. And this is one of the earliest, uh, it's not the earliest, but it's one of the very early um, geospatial analytic use cases where people were using um, uh, geospatial relationships mixed with uh, the domain problem that they were trying to solve. Uh, to, to really find a solution to the problem. And what he found was a huge spike here at the Broad Street pump. And that well, the Broad Street pump, where people were pumping out water, um, is where the epidemic was spreading from. And using this map, 
and the analysis, he was able to get the city of London to basically shut off the pump and basically in shutting off the pump end the cholera outbreak. And so the use of analytics obviously, you know, goes way back in time. You can obviously find earlier examples than this. I thought again, given that we're in the midst of a global pandemic, this is a pretty germane example to what we see going on in the world today. Um, but the neat thing here was John Snow's background. Does anybody know what his his degree was in or what his profession was? Any guesses? Let's see if we got any good guesses. There were great guesses on uh, who the picture was. So an econ background, a law philosophy background. And I like, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of people would say, well, since he's doing analytics, like Gene, you guessed mathematics or, or Ivan physics. You know, th this is what most people guess is that, you know, he's doing data science. So he must have had some mathematical econometrician type of a background. Although in 1854, there certainly weren't data science majors. It would be something like that. And the reality is it's just in some ways the opposite. He was a domain expert. He, he was, he's considered the father of epidemiology by many, but he was a doctor. He, he was actually an obstetrician by training. And this is what we really see. And, and I see this with, with great entrepreneurs. Usually it starts with domain knowledge and the data science is the and that gets added onto it, usually more than the other way around. Um, and again, this is why it becomes really important to, then to use tools and tech that allow people who are domain experts to be able to leverage modern day data science. And again and again, we see that example. The other thing we've seen over time and really just in, in my, my time and my career in the last two decades, I've seen you know, incredible change from the beginning of my career to now and really over maybe the last 18 months, you've seen not just the processing chips get faster with Moore's law, with all the other technology that's been added, the additional RAM, the um, you know, parallel threading, uh, the, you know, my computer today having multiple cores versus just a single core. I think I have 16, 16 threads running on the computer that I have here right now. I have GPU as well as CPU. The speed of the modern day compute is not one or two orders of magnitude faster. I mean, we're, we're 10,000 times faster versus just a, a very short time ago. And in addition to having that additional compute, we have all of these libraries, not, not just the languages of R and Python, but all of the open source libraries that, that come with, uh, with those languages. So when you look at the number of users and the number of packages, you really have algorithms that can solve anything. So, you know, before when I started my year, my, my career, if, if I were to go try to solve a, a machine learning problem, I'd have to code my own neural network and build it. And today I can use an open source library for a neural network um, and, and have it implemented with a drag and a drop. And again, huge difference. Uh, data equally, more data available than ever before. The pipes are larger and faster, the ability to move the data. And so with all of these things happening, the ability to solve problems has really shifted in an incredible way. If you ask me to solve a problem, you know, go explore the world and get data to answer the following questions. Again, beginning of my career, I was moving at, I'll use the analogy at the speed of a baby crawling at three miles per hour, but now I'm 10,000 times faster. And if I do it the same way through crawling, but just crawl really fast, it, probably it's not gonna have the same impact. I have to learn how to fly a new airplane. I have to learn some new skills and again, I see this with many entrepreneurs I meet with being very important. They have to learn the skills of, of analytics and they don't necessarily have to be the implementer of all of it, but they have to understand how, how analytics can impact the products that they're designing and the products that they're building. They have to learn to some degree how to fly these planes or at least enough about how the planes work uh, that they can, they can see the world through this new lens because the world looks a lot different up in this airplane than it does crawling around on the ground. Um, and, and this is frequently uh, a, a, a challenge as entrepreneurs go, go on, their, on their journey. So again, one of our missions is helping people learn, learn how to fly these planes, how to, how to take advantage uh, of this new ecosystem. And we see people from, from every area doing it. We see kids in school, I've seen as young as second grade uh, students learning how to code in Python. I've seen mid, mid and late career professionals uh, learning how to leverage data science. And I, I've seen it in every area, whether it's in the accounting department, the tax department of a company, 
through the engineering departments and the IT departments, really in every area, uh, at every um, level of experience, uh, people are, are learning these skills, which is really exciting to see. And the next challenge that people struggle with is this shift, this shift in paradigm. Turns out that digital transformation can be relatively difficult. And initially what we saw kind of in the first wave of digital transformation, people were focused on what happened in the past. They looked at collecting a lot of data and talking about how big their data stores were. Um, it was very rooted in IT. And, and that started now to change pretty dramatically. And the kind of the next wave we saw, maybe, maybe starting about 10 years ago, if you went to a conference talking about data and analytics and machine learning, it went from talking about big data to talking about the analytic methodology. Even the titles of the position changed. Maybe 15 to 20 years ago, the titles were chief data officer. Now you see chief analytic officers or chief data and analytic officers. The analytics started to become more important. People would ask, you know, what type of algorithms are you using? And I'd even say today, when I talk to, talk to folks, it's less about how big the data is. I think people realize you can solve incredible problems with small amounts of data sometimes, sometimes big data, but you don't need big data. Big data doesn't mean big value. Um, it's big, big problems can mean big value, uh, but not necessarily big data. And it went from then talking about, hey, you know, are you using deep learning or a cognitive engine? It went from that kind of a conversation to, you know, again, big value can have simple analytics. It's not how complex the analytic is that determines how valuable uh, the solution is. And so uh, that conversation has changed. And, and now really in kind of the current wave we're in, um, it's more about democratization, having analytics be used in every aspect of your product or um, a, of a solution, and really focus more on how transformational is the solution versus how big is the data or how complex is the analytic. And so we've seen the world go through these phases. And, and again, if I rewind time, it's not surprising. I mean, this picture also taken from London, um, again, back in the same time period, 1854 again, another pioneer in data science. Any, any idea who this one is? I've already given you a hint. Uh, in data science. So again, someone got it right off the bat. I wish I, if we were in person, I'd be tossing out prizes. I'd you know, throw out you know, a, a toy for you. But unfortunately, if I throw it, it's going to smash the computer screen. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stay away from that. But yeah, this is Florence Nightingale. Um, and you know, Florence was uh, an amazing data scientist, although she, she didn't carry that title. We weren't really talking about data scientists back in 1854. Um, but Florence was uh, asked to tackle a different problem. She was assigned to a field hospital uh, in, in Crimea. And you know, the death rate at these hospitals was very high, represented by these kind of gray outer bars. I think the death rate was about 40% in, in the field hospitals. And most of the deaths uh, that were occurring were actually happening from disease, not, not battle. Uh, the, the actual battle injuries were a small proportion of the deaths. And so basically, you know, if you were if you were assigned out in the Crimea, and you ended up in the hospital, you had a fair chance of, of not making it out of the hospital. Um, and you know, this obviously was not good. And so Florence collected incredible amounts of data, books upon books of data, and analyzed the data. She did a lot of, I'll call it A-B experimentation, tried different things, looked at the, the effects. And you can see when she hit this date in April, fundamentally the death rates went, went completely down. Uh, to this much lower level is just a couple percent. So she went from like a 40% death rate in the field hospitals down to like a 2% death rate, uh, a lower death rate than some of the best hospitals in London. So, well, you know, wow, that is, that's an incredible impact driven by this data analysis. But the key here again, it, to me, and the pattern that I see in, in these two stories is the pattern I see again and again. It's the entrepreneur with domain knowledge. You know, she had an entrepreneurial spirit, in this case, to save lives versus to make money. Um, but fundamentally, she, she set out to, to do this. And while she was using data and analytics, her training was as a nurse. And so, you know, she knew a lot about a domain and fundamentally was leveraging that domain knowledge and some understanding of data and analytics to, to make a huge impact. And so I'll show one example, um, this one from the U.S. government. Um, I apologize that I'm going from disaster to disaster here, from pandemic to war to uh, hurricane response. 
Um, but I think this is a great example of kind of what we see. And if you think about this in maybe in a different lens, you could see this as becoming the beginning of a product or a company, um, but it's a US government example. And so FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is tasked with responding to, to hurricanes and, and helping communities rebuild. And one of the things they have to do is assess the damage to structures. And if the damage is over 50%, they need to build to a higher code so it doesn't happen again. And if the damage is lower than 50%, it's more minor, then fundamentally they can build to the same code. And so when Hurricane Irma and Maria hit the Caribbean, over 146,000 structures were damaged. Now you can imagine if you needed to send in teams of two and three engineers to each one of these structures, which is what the current process had been, um, to assess each one on how damaged it was, and that could take you know, four to eight hours per structure, do the math and you'll quickly realize that it could be a decade before we, we really can rebuild everything. And that's just, that, that's just completely unacceptable. And so a group of experts who respond to hurricanes regularly uh, decided that they needed to come up with a better way. So armed with some laptop computers, battery generators, and Ultrix running on it, uh, you know, they showed up to the islands and they figured out that they could build models. And they had people uh, basically take a sampling of some structures, assess the damage, and then built models based on uh, wind data, tide surge data, elevation data, and building structure data to basically predict what percent damage each structure was at. And using that machine learning, they could quickly determine which ones were definitively above 50%, which ones were certainly below 50%, and what small number of structures needed humans to go out and assess. You could argue they just created a product on the fly, in the field, in the dark, with no power. They just created an incredible product that will then get reused every disaster thereafter uh, to do this type of work. An incredible impact, saving millions of dollars, uh, speeding really the road to recovery for tens of, of thousands of people. Um, this is really the way that we frequently see this innovation happening. It's, it's machine learning combined with this domain knowledge making incredible impact. Um, our product is used by about 40% of the global 2000. We have over 6,400 customers today. You've probably heard of a few of them. We're used by large and small companies. Uh, to do exactly this, sometimes productizing things, sometimes building uh, analytics into their existing systems and into their existing processes. I'll skip ahead for a second. And we're really used in, in every area of the business, uh, whether it's in the HR area or the finance area, security, uh, chief revenue officer, uh, really every area of the business, the use cases are, are basically unlimited. So I'm gonna pause for a second, again, try to open it up to questions. I don't know that anybody can unmute, but you can certainly ask questions in the chat window. We just got a few minutes remaining here, about five minutes, and I, I did wanna make sure that we could have some exchange. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions, feel free uh, to type them into the chat window. Uh, but my hope is what you take away from this is regardless of how deep your knowledge is on machine learning, on analytics, it likely will be an important part of, of your product development, your company's um, uh, cycle. So one of the questions that came in is, can you talk a little bit about explainable AI and, and, and what explainable AI is? And so absolutely, um, when people build models to predict things, um, there are many models that are very easy to understand. So if you think about a linear regression, you have a scatter plot, you draw a best fit line through the data points, it's very, easy to understand the model and why it's predicting what it's predicting. And so the, uh, the level of understanding, the ability to explain that type of a model is relatively easy. If you think about what a weather model looks like and the hundreds of inputs that go into it and it's not linear, it's got lots of nonlinear relationships, um, it, it's taking pictures and turning pictures into structure, these are harder to explain. And so there's been a, a lot of work in the field of AI to, to make sure that we have ways of explaining models so that they don't become black boxes. And different products and different companies uh, do better and worse at ensuring that the models that are being generated are understandable and highly explainable. And hopefully it's almost intuitively obvious why that's important. Um, 
most people don't simply want to implement a model into a product as a black box that they don't understand. Because even if it's accurate, maybe one day in the future, it'll become not accurate. Something like COVID will hit and the predictions won't make sense anymore. And if you don't understand how the model's working, you won't realize how that might impact you. And so we're very passionate that when we build models, when we do analytics, it needs to be highly explainable, easy to understand. Um, but you'll, you'll find products that have varying degrees of black boxes versus kind of open and explainable uh, techniques that they use in, in their product. Um, and then another question uh, from Aaron, I can see a Fortune 500 using this because data analytics isn't their core competency. However, for a startup, wouldn't it be difficult for them to seed the technology stack? And I don't, you know, the key here is you're not seeding it. Like you're gonna, you're gonna buy a, a server or a laptop computer. I don't view that as your, you're seeding your competency on how to use a computer because you decided not to build one yourself. Um, when you use a open source library like XGBoost, because it's a world-class library for doing some machine learning. You're not seeding your knowledge of machine learning because you used an open source library. Many of the things that uh, commercial software bring to the table, the, it, it's not having you seed anything, it's making you faster, uh, it's enabling you to be faster at building the solution you need to build. Otherwise you are rebuilding, you know, in the case of Altrix, what we took 23 years to perfect, and you'll continue to sink money into that tech stack to make it better and better versus having a company that, that that's all they're focused on is giving you that tech stack. So at the end of the day, I don't, I don't think using, whether it's an open source library or using a commercial piece of software or buying a computer versus building it on your own is, is seeding that as a startup. I think it's knowing where your value add is. Are you a computer company? Are, are you selling an algorithm? Are you selling the tech stack really? Or are you selling the solution to a domain problem? And in 90% of the cases of startups that I talk to, they're selling solutions to domain problems. They're just leveraging all of this other stuff uh, to do it. So with that, um, if there aren't any other questions, I do wanna keep us on time here. I'll turn it back over to our host.